it looks like that's uh, our time here. Uh, so we'll get going. Um, appreciate everybody for showing up here. Um, these lunch and learns are a great thing that uh, we got going. So just uh, super happy to have George Haynes with us here today. Just gonna give a brief um, introduction to him and tell you about him. Um, so we're talking today about financial stimulus and that's a really important topic for us. And so really what we're looking at is agricultural stimulus programs that you know, are super important to all our producers. Um, we're gonna examine the rationale for financial stimulus opportunities for agricultural producers. And we're going to look at some past and explore the proposals. And we're going to look at the farm bill, which is super important. So um, George, you know, he's one of the professors and extension specialists in the Department of Agriculture and Economics. And so he's very important um, to us. And you know, we get some great presenters just like him. And of course, we really appreciate that. Um, and so some other um, things we want to talk about. So. Um, his primary line of research is the small business finance. And so he studies financial structure of small businesses, lending behavior, depository institutions, and response of small businesses to disaster and disaster assistance. His instructional responsibilities include delivery of Montana Agricultural Outlook, conducting training for low resource borrowers, and educating farmers and ranchers on agriculture policy and issues. So super excited for this one. I think this is really important to, gosh, everybody um, in Montana Farmers Union. So, um, I will let George take it over. Thank you, George. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, do this presentation today at noon. I think, uh, as Matt's kind of already alluded to, uh, you know, uh, stimulus programs are really critically important right now. They've taken on a whole new look, I think, in the last um, two months here as we think about negotiating the Farm Bill, which sounds kind of uh, unusual that we would care about such things, uh, but it's um, as we'll see as we go through this webinar today that it's more important now than it has been in negotiation of any farm bill that I'm aware of, you know, going back into the 1990s. And it's primarily because since 2018, we've had a tsunami, a regular tsunami of st stimulus programs that have arisen in agriculture. In fact, the uh, PLC programs and art programs under the Farm Bill have become relatively unimportant, not unimportant, but certainly a, certainly a small share of the uh, what we think about is stimulus um, in, in the ad hoc programs, which you'll we'll talk about quite a bit today in terms of things like the CFAP, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, in some, some respects, the Market Facilitation Program, all of those things have pumped a lot of stimulus money into agriculture. Where this plays into farm bill, the negotiations going on right now is I think there's a there's a substantial discussion going on now whether the new farm bill is going to absorb all of these ad hoc payments that are sitting out there, or is it going to get rid of all of them? And so we'll have a little bit of um, you know some sense of that as we kind of go through this. What I I've been concerned about the stimulus uh, in in the interests of of the federal government, in particular in farm policy, really goes back to the 1970s. You know, prior to that, if you had uh, you weren't a successful farmer ranch operation in the United States, especially in the early 1900s, um, Congress uh, and the House and Senate were both willing to let you go broke. Uh, that was okay because then you could go ahead and the farm would go bankrupt. Then somebody could buy that operation, and we would progress through um, through time uh, with uh, those things occurring. Well, in Montana, it was a substantial it was very substantial because we saw during the nineteen you know from nineteen fifteen to the nineteen thirties a lot of larger operations were built in Montana based on uh, farms becoming available through the bankruptcy process, and then people able to buy that property by you know coming up to speed on their taxes. More recently, uh, things have changed, you know, especially as we go from the early 1970s going forward, because there was an interest in having the federal government involved. And the involvement was to save these farmers, farms and ranches we'll talk about in some detail here, not just to let them go, um, go bankrupt. Uh, even though there's a lot of consolidation in agriculture today, there's a lot more incentive, I think, to try to keep these farm and ranch operations uh, viable. So where do we start? Well, we start with farm, the farm programs really um, 
help farms, uh, beginning farmers get started. But this is stage one of this. We do it in a number of different ways. One of them through the beginning farmer the rancher program. The Farm Service Agency has operating and ownership loans that are out there to help younger, you know, new farms and ranches get started. They have even have a youth program. In Montana, we have a program here with the State Department of Ag that is uh, really grow through ag, which allows, uh, you know, some grant money to be available as long as there's some matching money for that. And in the beginning, farmer rancher loan program. And then there's, we have some other ventures that are out there to help people identify your cultural land that they might actually buy with FarmLink. So there's these programs that allow you to put some funding into those that want to start farms and ranches here. And they're really, you know, targeting younger producers. At the next level of that, there's a series of programs that are available to help farms and ranches to be figure out how to grow. And because oftentimes, as with any business operation, you may start it, but you may not be viable. And so you need to think about what you're going to do to scale it up so that you can keep this farm and ranch operation going. And there's a series of programs. One of them is federal crop insurance. We're going to talk about that now, and we're going to talk about it as the last thing I'm going to talk to you about today as we talk about the farm bill, but really an important uh, piece of legislation or a, a program that's uh, administered by a risk management agency. And there are you know, benefits uh, to younger producers in, in that particular program as well, but primarily it's to, to help all farms and ranches that are out there um, be uh, provide some safety net underneath them through, through crop insurance. The uh, FSA has their series of programs as well, which many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, through their storage programs, their marketing assistance, conservation reserve program, and a host of others that, uh, again, are focused on this idea of how do we grow this farming operation, put some money out there to allow you to scale up. The NRCS has a series of uh, programs as well. I just spent my morning today, in fact, talking to a new NRCS economist here at the uh, in, in Bozeman. But through environmental quality program and through conservation steward program, stewardship program, uh, also with this idea of how do we grow uh, this uh, farm or ranch operation that's, uh, that's there. And as you can see, as we'll talk with NRCS here in a little bit, but lots of conservation language and what they're what they're doing these days. The most important part of this in some ways, at least in the things that I spend a fair bit of time thinking about, uh, if you look at small businesses in your community, um, there's none of them that have income insurance that they can buy. One of the important things that you have as an agricultural operation is that you have income insurance, you have essentially granted to you through the price loss coverage and agricultural risk coverage programs. You can actually buy crop insurance, which is really important as we'll talk about a little bit later. But you have these, these programs that are out there and really these are just to save the farm and ranch community uh, because they're al allowing you during times when things get tough, they're gonna step in and at least provide some safety net or uh, to keep you, the uh, ranching or farming operation viable. The uh, big pieces of that, of course, uh, are the uh, already uh, through price loss coverage and agricultural risk coverage being perhaps the most important, but also uh, the NAP program, uh, livestock forage disaster program. We've had quite a bit of that money in Montana, uh, some degree with livestock indemnity, where you've had higher than average mortality rates. You can get some additional funding there. Occasionally, we have the catch-all at the bottom of this with the, this ELAP program that comes into play whenever everything else uh, isn't going to provide any assistance. There's usually that that might be available for some full level sort of, of assistance to help, you know, save the operation as well. We'll spend a little bit of time, in fact, quite a bit of time toward the end of this talking about Inflation Reduction Act. There's some parts of that that are really important for conservation purposes, but also for people that are uh, distressed borrowers that are trying to uh, hoping to keep their operation going. And we'll talk about the details of that uh, here and soon. So those are the most important pieces of it, whether you're beginning in business or whether you want to grow your operation or scale it up. And then at the, the third leg of that stool is, you know, what are we doing to save these farm and ranch operations so that they might exist to, uh, to uh, 
uh, to tomorrow rather than being um, absorbed by somebody else through um, the things that we don't like to talk about through foreclosures or bankruptcies. So what about, what's this look like? Uh, this is some data that's from the US. I'll show you the Montana data here in just a minute. But um, where the story's at in much of this, if you look at over on the right-hand side of this in 2020, and it's uh, is the year that was has really kind of set the stage for what we're thinking about as we're going downstream to the farm bill here. But the uh, the brown part of that is the the farm subsidy programs that are out there, as you, as you can see, so really substantial sorts of numbers. Uh, in fact, over in the uh, about you know over thirty billion dollars that were put into that pot. Conservation subsidies, uh, also important. Uh, disaster subsidies, the next little piece in the orange, and then finally at the top of that. Um, things that all of you or many of you are involved in with crop insurance subsidies, which, well, they're, they're really critically important in this discussion because the, the crop insurance subsidies are, you know, go to, are in the range of kind of 50% or higher as you think about the premiums that are paid to the U.S. taxpayers pick up about 50% or more of that and, and the farm and ranch operation picks up the rest of it. So that became the kind of the really important uh, sort of year as we th think about what's going on with um, with things that we're going to deal with here more uh, in the uh, going downstream. As you look at Montana, we look a little bit more skewed in some ways because we have more uh, money that paid out in farm subsidy programs uh, and primarily in this particular instance, um, had you know substantial subsidies paid uh, in in the form of ARC and PLC payments, as we had some you know weather that was uh, weather related issues that took, caused Montana to look a little bit different, maybe than they did nationally, and then the other parts of it, the conservation piece of it, and the uh, crop insurance piece uh, looked uh, in, in disaster piece looked about the same, and the crop insurance piece looked about pretty similar as well. As you can see in 2021, all of a sudden, some of the disaster subsidy money became a lot more important in Montana that uh, all of a sudden the orange uh, piece of this rectangle here all of a sudden uh, looked a lot, was much larger and the uh, subsidy portion of it, the farm, the, the ARC and PLC portion became relatively uh, less important here. When you look at this on a national basis, the numbers are pretty stark. I don't have 2020 on this graph, but it was just in an article I read just a couple of days ago that's now available. And uh, the uh, percent of uh, money from the uh, the Title I programs or the farm uh, PLC programs and uh, and, and ARC programs was about um, around a little less than 5% here in Montana in the subsequent years. And the uh, money in the other programs with the disaster loan program, or the disaster programs that were out and sort of CFAP, the uh, market facilitation uh, program as well, all of a sudden those became very important nationwide as those were almost 70% uh, of the money that went out in what we consider to be subsidization. So looking forward, as everything we've looked at up to this point in time is really looking backwards, but now looking forward into what's going on, the Inflation Reduction Act was a piece of legislation passed in 2022, not very long ago, in fact, just a, almost a year ago. Uh, and as you can see on the, the summary of this, the conservation programs were a really important part of this. And then some other ones were uh, equally uh, important with rural development. We're not going to talk about that today. And that's often a little bit different tangent than, than, the, than the, what we need to visit about here. Farm, uh, the FSA Farm Loan Borrow Assistance Program was uh, combined with uh, some other uh, funding would prove to be really important as well with about $6 million in that pot. So we're going to spend time today really talking about conservation programs and then talking about farm loan programs, at least in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we'll follow that with a discussion about um, things going on with, with the farm bill. So what did this Inflation Reduction Act, Act look like? Well, uh, as you can see here, uh, conservation is really the name of the game. 
And uh, I think as you look at what's going on with NRCS this day, they're putting a lot of their emphasis actually on what's going on in, I, uh, in IRA. Uh, in fact, they have a person hired here in Bozeman that that server's sole responsibility is uh, is uh, is uh, talking about conservation programs under this piece of legislation. So you're going to hear a lot more about it uh, as time goes forward here. But much more important than anything else uh, in this uh, in this pie chart here, as I said, we're not going to talk about rural development. That's a whole other division with you, you within USDA that's a lot more community development related. But the other two pieces of this with farmers and forestry, much bigger component than either one of those. So what is we broke this down and to look at the cal the uh, allocations under the conservation uh, title, as you can see here, Equip is uh, you know kind of the big Kahuna that's out there, followed by uh, CSP, well the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which we'll spend a little bit of, not much time on today, uh, and then followed by Conservation Stewardship Program with about three you know, three and a quarter billion dollars. Uh, in that program. And I think if you look at where NRCS is involved in this right now, um, the EQUIP and CSP programs are where they're putting a lot of effort to figure, figure out how they're gonna uh, allocate, you know, $12 billion worth of money here, um, essentially, as we kind of move through time. As we, and this, this, this is another, you know, uh, pie chart to show you what I just talked to you about, but anyhow, EQUIP, 43% of these, uh, Money that's available for conservation programs is going to be uh, through through that particular piece of the puzzle here. So as we think about this uh, IRA funding, um, there's you know the top part of this has become really critical, and it was over in, in North Dakota just a week ago, and uh, really a lot of emphasis on all of these agricultural conservation practices at the moment there, and in fact, a fair bit of economic analysis going on as well as they think about, you know, what are we, what are you gonna be doing that are direct improvements to soil carbon, reduction in nitrogen losses, and then, you know, reduction capture, avoidance, sequester of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and so on. Uh, it was interesting over in North Dakota to see all the emphasis uh, under some of this similar legislation here by the ethanol producers in particular that are really going after this uh, hook, line, and sinker to, to capture as many uh, carbon-related dollars as they, uh, you know, might be able to uh, to end, end up, uh, you know, bringing into their operations. So a lot, a lot happening there. There's technical assistance that's built into this. Uh, technical assistance has become a part of all USDA programs, if you haven't noticed more recently, but across almost all agencies now is a lot of interest in having people in the agency that are able to explain these programs to you. Um, and uh, that's where this kind of plays in. The last part of this is, uh, you know, really an NRCS sort of issue and uh, that, that there, there's actually, as I said before, funding available for people to provide assistance and, and analysis actually for all of these carbon related uh, issues that we're trying to tackle with uh, IR fund, uh, IRA funding. The other part of this, and it might relate to some, uh, some of your people in your community, but a really important piece of this, we've been doing some presentations of this in Montana already. And the part of this that we're most interested in is, is the Distressed Borrower Assistance Program it actually has some legs under it now. The assisted discrimination one that's right above that really doesn't have any legs on it underneath it right now, but that, I think that'll be happening, you know, relatively soon here. Here's how this particular program um, uh, is working. This, they made a run at this during the, the American Rescue Plan, and their American Rescue Plan language was such that it was really just reaching out to um, farmers that... Uh, where it could claim some discrimination at some level. And this has kind of been broken apart uh, more recently here. This particular program here is now um, a program that has some really important language. And the uh, it's an agricultural program payment for debt reduction is one piece of that. And I'll talk to you in just a second about this cancel cancelization of debt. When, uh, which is also uh, as part of this uh, distressed borrower assistance programs, but they work in very 
you know, some very different ways. I think that the IRS got very wise to how this program ought to work uh, once they dove into it. Um, initially, this program was set up so that they were going to provide, um, you know, automatic assistance. This is the first tier of this. And what happened with that was um, about a year ago um, in October, they, uh, anybody that had a, they were delinquent with their direct payment loan that they had from the from Farm Service Agency. Uh, had that uh, that erased. Well, you think about that. Well, how could that happen? Well, it was pretty simple. It was just an electronic trans um, uh, transmittal. Uh, so that I think spent about eight hundred million dollars on that. Um, but that was an agricultural program payment. Is the way that that was sold to them. So. What ended up happening was that you had this debt that was a, redu it was a reduction in your debt. In fact, it was an elimination of debt. And then they sent you a 1099. You know, this is like you being an independent contractor. They sent you a 1099 and you, you had tax liability as associated with that. So while you might have reduced your debt, you may have had a substantial amount of tax liability you all of a sudden uh, needed to worry about. And I'll do a little example for that in just a second. Um, as and I told you, the IRS got pretty smart uh, this time uh, after they did that because they found out there were a lot of people couldn't didn't have any money to pay the IRS. So this was then revised, uh, so it became a cancellation of this debt, um, you know, rather than a, a program payment that had some uh, uh, income tax uh, consequences to them. So that's kind of where we're. It's it's we moved down the pike with this. I think there, there's a fair bit going on with this at the moment. I think it took care of most of what was going on at the FSA initially. There's now some case by case assistance that's out there where they're looking at uh, farms and ranches that are looking at either a foreclosure or bankruptcy that will allow you to utilize the same program. And again, to you know to talk about saving the farm and ranch business, that's exactly what this is about to do something to help you uh, get rid of some of your debt and keep the business going. This is in motion, as I understand it, with FSA at the moment. I don't know of a single case where this has actually been implemented. I know quite a few cases. They got the automatic assistance piece up there, and it seems like it's, you know, probably worked okay. So the uh, the way that this is his work thus far is essentially the direct FSA loan part of it was the one they really got started initially. They, and, then they, and when it gets below the line uh, with the guaranteed loans to commercial lenders and so on, that is taking a little bit more time to get uh, get underway. But there's still those opportunities for people that have debt out there that they think um, might be eligible uh, under this particular program. The uh, Tax liability part, as I told you before, is the issue. And that was initially what happened. And, and more recently, they have a, this to be, it can be this debt that's actually just discharged. Uh, if you're thinking about this being something for you or your neighbors, it's really important to make sure you have a tax account that's working for you on this. This is not for the faint at heart in terms of taxation, because there's some important consequences with this. Um, it, as you think about going um, utilizing this program. So anyhow, um, these are just all the categories that are there. It's just a matter of whether you're, you know, you've dealt with uh, FSA on this as a direct borrower, you know, do you, how are you behind, you know, in other places where you're 60 days behind and so on. Are you thinking about going through a foreclosure or a bankruptcy? And again, all of this is when you can go over and visit with FSA about how you need to proceed. I'm going to go through this example pretty quick because we're kind of, uh, I'd like to be done here in about, you know, 10 minutes or so. I want to talk a little bit about the farm bill, but let's just see what happened to some of these early people that, that got some debt relief. This particular guy here um, got $100,000 worth of debt relief, which is a pretty substantial amount of money. But then uh, that $100,000 of debt relief that they had turned into owing the federal government about $6,000. Montana tax was a little over $5,300. They had self-employment taxes because you're, keep in mind, you got a, a, a 1099, which, you know, is exactly what, you know, independent contractors have to deal, but you end up dealing with self-employment issues around Social Security and Medicare. 
that was another, you know, almost $14,000. So this person ended up with about $25,000 that was due to the Internal Revenue Service in one form or another. So sound like a good deal on the front end of it, but not so it's a good deal when there's nobody to help you with the taxation part of that. Well, what happened was that under the cancellation and debt part of this legislation or this 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 change in the rules, uh, that 25,606 at the bottom disappeared. And so there was no nothing you had to worry about, at least in terms of uh, taxation. The only part of this is that you have to have some rationale, and you don't don't read all of this. But the um, the middle, the part of this that's highlighted in red is probably important because it could be a significant benefit to to people that are not at farming anymore, or they're financially insolvent, i.e., they've you know filed for bankruptcy, or they're still financially distressed, where they have a lot of you know, you know their their debt to asset ratios just don't look favorable. Those are the people who can use the cancellation language in this. Everybody else is probably still going to be stuck with this idea that, that this is just a government payment. You're going to get a 1099 that you're going to have some tax liability with it. So I think this is a really important word of caution that unless you're really in dire financial straits or you're out of the farming business, I don't think uh, looking for cancellation of debt's probably where you want to go. But talk to your accountant uh, before you you dive into that. Um, I don't think we need to look at too much at this, but you know there are income tax consequences. Uh, there's always a question mark once you get this debt cancellation. Will the Farm Service Agency still do any business with you? They've said they will, which is good news. Um, the uh, will you have support of local lenders as well that are willing to step in and help you? And then you know some people. We've been doing some of these talks around the state already that are, you know, they have signed up for Medicaid or the SNAP program or other welfare programs, and you may fall out of favor with those programs, so you may not have access to them uh, by just uh, taking this um, this debt relief here. Um, lots of tax management strategies. I don't think we need to go through those, but the same old things that you would do if you're you know, running any kind of business, you're going to try to figure out how to lower your tax liability, and that's exactly what you need to do here. The most important part of this is that if you're you dive into this program and get some help from FSA. You don't have to sign it. You don't have to sign on the dotted line. If it doesn't look like it's going to work for you, uh, you, you, you have no obligation, but you can have them take a look and see, see what your particular situation might look like. Uh, there's a discrimination language in, in this as well. We're not going to go through that primarily because that program has not gained any, there's just no legs under it yet. Uh, they'd have to define some things in there that are really critically important. One, what's it mean to be distressed? And then secondly, what's it mean to be discriminated against? Okay, the other part of this is I talked to the house is the farm bill. And uh, this is really important in what's going on. Uh, we pay about $140 billion. And you can see at the bottom of this, though, is what farms and the farm and ranch community gets out of this. Somewhere a little bit north of $20 billion of that turns out to be farm and that's paid to farmers and ranchers here in terms of the PLC and ARC programs, conservation and crop insurance. So most of it is the SNAP program, as you can see here, you know, this is the nutrition programs um, that are out there. They're a crucial part to get this legislation passed. You didn't have that built into this. My guess is you will never pass a farm bill because there are people there from urban areas that don't quite understand what's going on, but they do understand, uh, you know, some commodity programs. Um, so what are we looking at as this Title I commodity program goes? You know, it varies a lot from probably around a billion a year to maybe eight and a half billion dollars that go into the PLC and ARC programs. This is a forecast. You know, you can, I don't believe any forecasts going forward. Uh, but the most important part of this, you can see quite a bit of variance as we go from one year to the next in terms of how much money is paid out in those. And We've had some pretty substantial payments in these programs in Montana more recently because we've had some relatively dry years here, and that's where the price loss program and the, and the agriculture risk coverage program really are play are quite important. So, you know, lots of variance in this, but this just gives you an idea of what, you know, people looking downstream think are going to happen. I don't know uh, that that may or may not uh, occur, but I really really important uh, uh, Title One programs. The uh, 
the most important or one of the more important things on the block right now is what's happened with conservation programs. And as you look here, the, the purple uh, rectangles here are more important than anything else because that's the equip program. And you can see here what they think is likely to happen with equip. And I will keep it. One thing that's really important in this picture here is equip is going to kind of dole this money out over time. Uh, under the uh, uh, IRA uh, kind of guidelines. And so, as you can see here, as we get into 27 and 28 and so on, the equip becomes more important. So while you might be out there looking for some equip money more in the near term, you're going to find out that there's there's a little bit more of that funding that's going to be on the clock as we kind of move forward uh, in in the uh, the next uh, next few years here it's a little bit the same with the csp program but they not quite as dramatic uh, but again those programs are gain it they're going to gain some momentum here um in the in the near term crop insurance is the other part of the uh the farm program or the farm bill about 10 billion dollars a year doesn't seem to vary a whole lot in that but you can see the 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 Green or the the blue part of this is really the the um, premium subsidy that goes to the farm farm and ranch communities here with crop insurance. Remembering is inclusive of things we think about with crops, but also with livestock as well. Um, and then uh, with the underwriting or what it takes to uh, you know market that insurance to uh, the uh, farm and ranch community as well, as long as the underwriter and the amount that they pay for the people that underwrite this insurance to actually make the payments. So that's kind of what what it looks like. As we as we look at uh, what's going on with the uh, the subsidy programs, as I said at the outset, the big challenge here is whether they're going to try to match that almost fifty billion dollars worth of uh, funding that was available, you know, really starting in early as two thousand and eighteen and running really up to two thousand and twenty two in some form or another. Are they going to try to match some of that? I think if you look at what's out there, I think there's a lot of interest right now in getting higher reference prices for the, the Title I programs, you know, getting the prices for the commodities that you're growing, the wheat and barley here in Montana, in particular, because just getting saying those reference prices higher so that if you're you know, below that reference price, you're going to get some, uh, some uh, money out of these federal programs. With the grain prices that we're looking at right now, you know, the likelihood of having any PLC payments probably doesn't look all that favorable at the moment, but there might be some, you know, some opportunities within um, both of these programs, or primarily in the ART program, to still make some payments to you. Um, the other thing that's out there, which is the new kid on the block in some ways, this is all because of this, you, you know, the war in the Ukraine and their, the impact on Russian exports. Uh, especially with fertilizer and to some degree with, you know, any oil, oil related products, but drop it. They want to have some, high, some protection on the input side. When are talking about reference prices above there. We're talking about the output side, what are you selling your commodities for, but on the input side of what are we going to do with fertilizer in particular uh, in, in perhaps, uh, you know, fuel kind of falling off, you know, that's, the importance, but certainly with the fertilizer prices still remain out there as being of interest. So higher input prices uh, and some subsidization available for those. The one that's out there with the IRA, the IRA which passed back in September of a year ago, just increased uh, conservation uh, spending. You know, we've already talked a little bit about what EQIP and CSP look like, but I think there's still uh, some additional interest in seeing more and more conservation money may uh, become available. Uh, there's a, a line of thinking, at least among some of the uh, House and Senate people, about increased use of ad hoc um, aid programs. When talking about ad, uh, ad hoc, that's just having programs that are out there when you have a severe drought or you have, a, you know, issues around a lot of livestock being, um, you know, killed for some reason that you would have programs that would step in right behind those. Um, so there might be some, you know, some interest in doing some of that. That's being offset a little bit by the one target that's out there as per some more recent work. In fact, there's an article out on Politico uh, just, a, you know, a couple of days ago that it looks like the topic at hand is going to be crop insurance. 
there seems to be interest from both sides of the aisle, maybe in changing crop insurance. We'll see how what happens with that. Uh, but I think there's uh, the you know certainly some interest in seeing the you know portion of that that goes to um, you know marketing the product maybe needs to change some, but also just in the amount of the subsidization, uh, there's going to be some uh, discussion is uh, and in the next few months prior to the you know this bill going. Uh, it, it being passed uh, on what those 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 look like, but how much um, support there is for that for that I don't know yet. It's just uh, one of the topics that's gained some momentum over the last uh, really in the last few weeks as we think about what the farm bill might uh, might be doing. So that's um, my story. I think the systems is is really critically important. Took a little look backwards. I think that you know other programs that we've have been around for a while. Most of those are, are really critically important as we think about keeping these farms and ranches in business. And then looking forward to what's out there with um, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has been you know, kind of uh, an interesting piece of legislation to track because there's been you know, a fair bit of time and effort put into of changing some of that legislation as this debt ceiling um, um, uh, challenge uh, was uh, you know out in front of everyone and what uh, so that that's been uh, talked about there uh, and but then the farm bill you know following in behind us and all the discussion around that as we uh, are moving forward to a new year of uh, policy so that's uh that's my story on subsidies and I I think it's a you know really critically important topic and be happy to entertain any questions any anyone has about or comments for that matter that you have about um, uh, about subsidization <clears throat> oh yeah go ahead if, if you guys have questions if you're uh, comfortable just uh, unmute yourself and uh, camera on and give us a question or you know if you're more comfortable putting in the chat that's awesome too so and fire away whenever you guys are ready. Hey, George, this is Walter Schweitzer, uh, president of Montana Farmers Union. Thanks for doing this. Um, it, you know, the this discussion is is important for us to understand as we move into the next Farm Bill debate. You know, one of the things that that we're struggling with here in in Montana and 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 the rest of the United States is is farmers are getting older, and um, and and it's getting um, uh, it, it concern about who's going to be the next generation of farmers and how do they even get started? How can they how can they get involved in this? And and I appreciate that some of these programs are are set up to help young farmers. But but you know some of these programs also help the old farmers get bigger and prevent younger farmers from accessing the opportunities to farm. And crop insurance is one of those. As long as we don't have a cap on the amount of crop insurance you get, uh, many farmers uh, are utilizing this program uh, to access credit so they can buy their neighbor's farm and get bigger. And, um, and then that really kind of prevents a younger farmer uh, from that opportunity. And um, I just kind of want your thoughts on capping crop insurance and, and um, at what levels that would be a, a good idea to cap those crop insurance payments. Yeah, that's a important topic that's out there. I think with everyone right now, I think the, um, you know, some of the discussion around that, I think is, um, <laughs> you know, who do you want to provide your subsidies to becomes a critical sort of a component of that. And I think, you know, I've been a proponent for quite a long time and I, I know everybody doesn't agree with this sort of notion of that, but I think there is a, there is an, uh, some uh, rationale for uh, doing some means testing about when we think about 
uh, subsidization in general, but maybe crop insurance is a place to start with that. So you think about who, who needs this kind of support because again, you know, crop insurance kind of fits into that program. I think you're probably, Walter, probably right in suggesting that it it provides some support to, um, uh, you know, keep this family farm going, but also, you know, it's going to provide additional resources to you if you uh, want to decide that you're interested in participating in some, cons some consolidation by buying out your neighbors or leasing your neighbor's property or whatever. But I think that there are producers out there that need that support and there are others that probably uh you know given their financial situation probably not so so important to them so that's kind of the way i've couched that whether you get into caps on that or not i think that's going to be a, a really uh important topic coming up here and i'd hate to put a number on that that's um uh, right off hand but i think that um we're going to see the number that's floating around right now in the, you know, among the uh, the political types in D.C. is 60 percent. And I think we're going to see a, a really a vigorous discussion around that number and uh, where that all ends up. I don't know at the end of the day, but I would suspect that um, uh, it's, it's going to change. And the only challenge I have in in that sort of logic is I think. Again, going back to my notion, I think that there are people that need that funding and those that maybe don't. And I think for the beginning farmer, the guy that's the young guy that's out on this farmer ranch operation um, and trying to get it going, maybe uh, higher percentages of uh, in, of crop insurance or higher uh, subsidy premium, uh, subsidization of premium probably important to them. Um, and for others, maybe not. And so I would think that there's probably a couple of different kinds of producers that are out there that um, we need to look at. And, and I think there is, there's a fairly robust discussion going on right now about what are we gonna do for small farmers versus people that are you know, a little bit larger uh, landholders and larger operations. Uh, and uh, th I think this, uh, my, this, this kind of plays into that same, uh, same discussion. Um, as I, I think there are, uh, we, we need to meet the needs of the, the, the farm and ranch community. There's no doubt about that. But um, uh, there, as uh, I've suggested, I think there are people that some people need it more than others. And I, I, I'd hate to put a number on it or for that reason. I just think that there are different numbers that need to apply for, you know, for different, uh, different people that depending on kind of where they're, what the financial condition of their, their farm and ranch operation happens to be. Well, well and I think George, Really, I think um, probably every farmer needs a a threshold of uh, security uh, in their in their uh, crop insurance. I, I just think that at at some point, uh, be it five hundred thousand dollars or some number, um, if they're if they're trying to insure more than that, that they should have to pay the full price of the crop insurance and not utilize taxpayer money to access credit so that they can get bigger. Yeah, I mean, your strategy following kind of my same idea that I have, I think as you um, as you become a you know, more viable business, I think that's probably true, yeah. This is an opportunity for uh, anybody to ask uh, George. He's got a lot of experience. I've seen him. Uh, uh, presented a, a bunch of different organizations and and he's pretty good at answering the question on the spot so if you got any questions take your take this opportunity to ask them it'll be good for us because montana farmers union we're recording uh this presentation and uh, we're going to put it on our website so that farmers that are out there trying to spray their crops or get a little bit more planted uh, can can watch this later this evening or or when we get a big rainstorm and they can't get in the field. So <laughs> ask away, please, if you would. I guess we've got a bunch of shy people here, George. <laughs> well, again, George, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it was good information. And um, and uh, we'll like I said, we'll put it on our website. Uh, let your neighbors know that it's out there, and um, and um, and I'm sure I'll see you at another conference someday soon, George. Yeah, well, yeah, Walter. Thanks a lot for inviting us to here at MSU to be on your webinar today. And uh, yeah, there'll be uh, 
lots of important discussions uh, coming forth here in the next few months. So yeah, I really appreciate having the opportunity to do the presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. That is great, George. Such uh, important information, such powerful information. You know, if anybody does have some questions later and you know, maybe you want to just look at this on the website as we get that up, you might have some more questions. You can always uh, email me and I can get you in contact with George. Um, so um, if there aren't other questions, um, I guess that'll be it for today. And thank you so much for everybody for coming. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, George, you still... Oh.